In future conflict scenarios against strategic competitors, the ability to cost-effectively deliver long-range standoff weapons and mass from non-traditional platforms expands warfighting flexibility and introduces new deterrence options, said Dr. Dean Evans, Rapid Dragon Program Manager. Recently, U.S. Air Force Special Operators and other U.S. and foreign military personnel completed a live fire of a Joint Air-to-Surface Standoff Missile Extended Range, or JASMIR, long-range cruise missile on a pallet from a cargo plane over Norway in early November in the first-of-its-kind test in Europe. The Rapid Dragon palletized effect system, capable of deploying long-range cruise missiles using standard airdrop procedures from a cargo aircraft, was successfully deployed from an MC-130 to Commando 2. It was another milestone for the U.S. Air Force's Rapid Dragon program, which aims to equip cargo aircraft for long-range attacks to expand the U.S. arsenal of strike aircraft and make it harder for adversaries to target U.S. forces. The U.S. military is showing allies how to use their cargo planes similarly, but the Air Force is still sorting out the logistics of operating those improvised bombers. The test on November 9 took place inside the Arctic Circle at the Andoya Space Defense Range in northern Norway. An MC-130J, the special operations variant of the C-130, from the UK-based 352nd Special Operations Wing, deployed the Rapid Dragon palletized effect system, which the Air Force Research Laboratory developed to launch long-range cruise missiles using standard airdrop procedures. Pallets carrying Joint Air-to-Surface Standoff Missile Extended Range cruise missiles, which have a range of about 600 miles, were sequentially released on a range over the Norwegian Sea, the laboratory said in a press release. Video released by the 352nd Wing shows an MC-130J dropping a pallet, its parachutes unfurling, and missile deploying and flying under its power before striking the ocean and detonating. This was the first live-fire Rapid Dragon test since December 2021 over the Gulf of Mexico and the first test in the U.S.-European Command Area of Responsibility. Rapid Dragon has advanced rapidly from a concept on paper to a live fire using a developmental prototype in 24 months, Dean Evans, the program manager, said in a release. Now less than three years from the program's inception, Rapid Dragon is being used by U.S. Special Operations Command Europe in the Arctic Circle. This is a testament to the team's focus on rapid fielding, Evans added. Rapid Dragon is now expanding from palletized munitions to palletized effects, which includes non-kinetic munitions, cargo resupply and intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance platforms, the AFRL said. The November 9 exercise was also part of the European Command's Atreus Operation Series, beginning in April 2021, to train NATO forces on capabilities located in Europe. A video released by U.S. Special Operations Command Europe shows U.S. and Polish personnel conducting palletized precision effects cargo training with a Polish C-130 on November 8. Rapid Dragon is meant to expand the fleet of aircraft that can deploy long-range weapons by incorporating cargo planes like the C-17 and C-130 that can operate from more bases than traditional bomber aircraft. Bolstering that fleet with aircraft that can operate from more bases is meant to frustrate adversaries that might target those aircraft and bases in a conflict in line with other Air Force efforts to disperse its operations, especially in the Pacific. An MC-130J is the perfect aircraft for this capability because we can land and operate from 3,000-foot highways and austere landing zones, whereas a bomber cannot. Lieutenant Colonel Valerie Knight, 
352nd Wing Mission Commander said in a release. Knight said that a crew qualified to drop heavy equipment could also deploy the Rapid Dragon Pallet, echoing officials who say other militaries could adopt the capability. The beauty of that capability is it doesn't require any aircraft modifications. It doesn't require any special aircrew training. It really just takes advantage of the characteristics of that platform. Lieutenant General Jim Slife, head of U.S. Air Force Special Operations Command, told reporters at the Air and Space Forces Association conference in September. We got a lot of allies and partners that have cargo airplanes. They don't necessarily have deep magazine heavy bombers, Slife added. But if we can give them similar kinds of capability to use with the cargo platforms we have, then we're helping our partners become more capable. Slive said a C-130 can carry as many long-range precision munitions as a B-52, and a C-17 can carry three times as many. The desire for more long-range strike options is primarily driven by the emergence of adversaries with long-range arsenals, chiefly China, but also Russia. From the Andoya range, major Russian bases on the Kola Peninsula would be within range of the Jasimir. Still, the test is not signaling to Russia or any adversary. U.S. Army Captain Margaret Collins told the Barents Observer before it was conducted. However, the U.S. was trying to deter Russian aggression. By demonstrating enhanced capabilities with allies, Lt. Col. Lawrence Melnikov told Stars and Stripes ahead of the November 9 test. It puts this thing within range of Russia. We are intentionally trying to be provocative without being escalatory, said Melnikov, Special Operations Command Europe's lead officer for Operation Atreus. Expanding the number of planes and bases involved in long-range strikes brings logistical challenges, especially in the Pacific, where the distances are vast, and the facilities the Air Force wants to start using often need to be improved. Slife said the logistical issues reflect something we're paying a lot of attention to right now, which is this idea that we're going to operate in very distributed, austere kind of environments and so forth. Even austere environments need some kind of logistics infrastructure, right? Part of what we're working through on the palletized munitions thing is weapons storage. And how do we actually think our way through where do we think we're going to keep these weapons? How are they going to be configured? Do we really want them out in the middle of a field somewhere next to a straight stretch of road? Slife added. We're kind of working our way through the logistics implications of these kind of concepts for how we operate. 